Okay, so today, welcome to Project Explained AP Physics C Mechanics, and today we're going to be talking about work, energy, and power. So for a quick review of all the concepts, you should recall that kinetic energy is equal to K equals 1 half mv squared. So something really important that you need to remember in this equation is that the V is re referring to speed, the scalar quantity, not the vector quantity. So as a result, kinetic energy can only ever be greater or equal to zero and can never be negative. So that's something that you should keep in mind. Work, the general formula we're looking at is F dot r which um in the scalar form is fd cosine theta we use that if the force is constant if the force is not constant then we have to use some calculus in there which is f is equal to work is equal to f dot dr from there we can derive the work kinetic energy theorem so if we rewrite this in terms of the integral of ma dot dr and from there we can rewrite it as m dv dt, just splitting up that acceleration there, into dr. Um, so dv dot dr, that'll be a scalar, so the vectors cancel out, or they become scalars. And we can rewrite it as m dr dt dv. dr dt is none other than the speed, so that's mv dv, so that's one half mv squared. So the work energy theorem is that the network not the individual work of any single component in the system, but the network of all of the net force, basically, is equal to the change in kinetic energy. The gravitational potential energy is U is equal to mg delta H, very near to the Earth's surface. When we go over gravitation, we'll learn the true form of gravitational potential energy, which is negative gmm by r, but for now we don't need to worry about that. Something to keep in mind is that gravitational potential energy could be positive or negative, depending on what we choose our reference position to be in terms of height. Um, so potential energy absolutely can be negative. And in fact, in the formalization with um, Newton's universal law of gravitation and gravitational potential energy formula that I just mentioned, gravitational potential energy we actually usually consider to be negative, but that's coming down the line. And then finally, power is basically the rate of change of doing work or the rate of change of energy of the system over time. So the instantaneous power is dw dt um, or f dot v. And if you're looking for just average power, that would be the work over time. So now let's get into some practice problems since that's usually the most helpful. So this first problem is basically we're going to be applying our work kinetic energy theorem. Um, you could also um, go at it with the calculus formula f dot dr, but that'll take a lot more time. So we have this vector function over here for position. So what I'm going to do first is differentiate at one time to get the velocity. So that would be a cosine ti minus b sine t j plus c k, right? And then what I want to do is find the velocity vectors at zero and at pi over two, since that's the interval that we've been given. So at v is equal to zero, the cosine of zero is one, so that would be a i, sine of zero is zero, so that would be plus zero j and then plus just ck, that's a constant. And then similarly for pi over two, cosine of pi over two is zero, so that'd be zero i minus bj plus ck. So then if I wanna calculate the kinetic energy at each of these places, k1 would be equal to one half m magnitude of the velocity squared, so that would just be a squared plus c squared. And then over here it would be one half m times b squared plus c squared. So if I'm taking the difference of those two, k2 minus k1, the c squareds cancel out, it would be one half m b squared minus a squared. So that is b, our answer choice. Okay, example number two. So a uniform chain of length L and mass m is lying on a smooth table, and one third of its length is hanging vertically down over the edge of the table. What is the work required to pull the hanging part onto the table? Um, so basically what we want to do is draw our diagram first. So we have basically m over 3, so one third of the chain hanging over here, and then the rest of the chain over here. 
So that means that this total length over here would be L by 3. So basically what we're doing is we're moving this guy's center of mass from basically L by 6 to this reference position over here. So the net work would just be the, or the not the net work, but the work that an external person would have to do would just be the change in gravitational potential energy, right? So that would be equal to m by 3 times g times l by 6, because we're considering this here to be our reference position. So initially it had negative gravitational potential energy, and then finally it had positive gravitational potential energy. So the work done by the external force would be the change in gravitational potential energy because it's increasing. The work done due to the gravitational force would be the negative of that. So that would be MGL by 18, which is choice D. So the next problem is a springs setup, which is very common for work, energy, and power. So they're basically asking us how much work must be done to move this block up to the top of the incline. So we know that it's starting and ending at rest. So that means the work net, which is the change in kinetic energy, is zero. So then we need to look at which forces are providing work, right? So the work done by the person, we're considering that the block is going to move up, right? This is the displacement vector. So the work done by the person is positive, but the work done due to uh, gravity would be negative, obviously, because the gravitational potential energy would be increasing, minus the work done due to the spring force, because that would be pushing back against the direction of motion. Whoops. So that all equal to zero. So the work done by the person is basically just the work done due to gravity plus the work done due to the spring. So the work done due to the gravity is really simple. That's just the um, negative change of the potential energy. Or in this case, we're just going to consider the change in potential energy um, because the gravitational um, potential energy is increasing. So the work done due to gravity is negative, but the converse of that is that as a result, the work done to the person has to be positive. So the change in potential energy is just mgd, right? Because it's going up to a height of d over there. So that's pretty easy. And then the work done to the, due to the spring would just be its potential energy, 1 half kl squared. Um, so we know that the sine of theta is equal to d divided by, if I call this whole thing, the length of the spring l, then l is equal to d over the sine of theta, which is d cosecant theta. So then this would be 1 half k d cosecant theta squared. If we add these both together, that's choice A. So an object moving with speed v, for example, 4. Um, so it's moving with speed v initially. And in a different scenario, we have um, a ball that's placed on a slab. So the slab um, is moving with speed uh, 2v. And the ball is placed, and the ball is moving with speed v relative to the slab. So we're looking at the ratio of the kinetic energy in scenario two versus scenario one. And for this question, the assumption being made here is that the frame of reference is with respect to the ground in both of them. So for obviously the initial scenario, it's really easy, you just one half mv squared. But for the second one where we have the slab, which is 2v and then the ball, which is V relative to that. So then the V relative to the ground would be V, the speed of the ball, plus the speed of the slab, because it's moving with speed V relative to something that's already moving with speed 2V relative to the ground. So that would be a total speed of 3V. So in scenario two, we have 1 half M 3V squared, whole squared. And as a result, you have that 3 in here, so it's going to be a factor of 9 greater than the initial scenario. So the answer is D. Example number 5 is an FRQ, which is a pretty classic setup. So they're asking us, when will the block um, 
lose contact with the sphere. So basically, when is n equals 0, right? So basically, that's going to occur when, um, since it's moving along a sphere, it's basically in circular motion, so it's going to have a centripetal, net centripetal force. So when, the, when Fc is provided totally by gravity, right, that's when it loses contact with the sphere. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to consider this here as my reference position. So if we look at that as phi, right, and if we consider this whole thing to be r, then the height or the initial gravitational potential energy would be mg times r minus r cosine phi, right? Just from that triangle, the cosine of phi is here, and the total distance is r, so r minus r cosine phi is the gravitational potential energy initially, equals 1 half mv squared. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to set up mv squared by r, since that's the net centripetal force formula. So um, 2mg times r minus r cosine phi equals mv squared. So then if we divide both sides by r, we got 2mg times 1 minus cosine phi equals mv squared by r. Right? Then from there, what we need to do is we need to set this side, so 2mg times 1 minus the cosine of phi to the um, component of gravity that contributes to the centripetal force. So if we consider the mass moving here, then gravity would be down here like that. So just from alternate interior, angle, alternate interior angles, this is also phi, which means that this component of gravity here would be mg cosine phi, right? Because the cosine of phi would be um, the adjacent over the hypotenuse, which is mg, so it's mg cosine phi. So mg cosine phi is equal to 2mg times 1 minus cosine phi. We can cancel out mg from both sides. So we get 2 minus 2 cosine phi is equal to the cosine of phi. And then from there, we can just say phi, phi, not theta, is the arc cosine of 2 by 3. Okay, so that's our answer for that FRQ question. For number six, which of the following statements is correct? So potential energy is always positive. We know that's not true. Depending on the reference position, it absolutely can be negative. So that one's wrong. Kinetic energy could be positive or negative. No, we're considering the speed and kinetic energy. So it has to be positive. Potential energy can be negative. Yup. Totally, right? Depending on the reference position. If we're below the reference position, we'd consider that negative potential energy um, just for gravity as an example. Kinetic energy is never positive. That's obviously wrong. It's always positive or zero. And then friction illustrates the concept of path independence. No, because friction is not a conservative force, right? So independ independence of path is only valid when the force is conservative, like gravity or um moving through an electric field or something like that. So the answer choice that is correct is C. So for this question, the mass um, is actually three kilograms, not 0.2 kilograms. But so the potential energy of a three kilogram particle is mu, uh, U of X, so potential energy function is mu, 8x squared plus 2x to the fourth, and the particle is at x equals 1, what is the magnitude of the acceleration, right? So we know that f should be equal to du dx in the one-dimensional case. Um, so what we want to do is take the negative derivative, so negative, and then if we differentiate that just from power rule, we get 16x um, plus 8x cubed, right? So then f of 1, if we just plug in 1, that would be negative 16 plus 8 is negative 24 newtons. So from Newton's second law, F equals MA. So negative 24 is equal to 3 times the acceleration. So then the acceleration would be negative 8 meters per second squared. However, they're asking for the magnitude. So that's just the absolute value, which would be 8 then. So the answer is B. So it's always important to keep in mind they're asking for magnitude or just the force because if it's magnitude, it has to be positive. 
Okay, example eight is a graph-based question. Give an example of neutral, unstable, and stable equilibrium and describe what the potential energy graphs look like in each scenario. So neutral equilibrium is when we're just kind of on a straight line, right? And if the mass gets displaced a little bit with some velocity, it's just going to keep moving in a straight line, right? So um, it's neutral because its motion from that point on will be constant. Stable equilibrium is if it's in a potential energy well, right? So what that means is that if the mass gets displaced up a little bit, the restoring force, it'll have a restoring force which will bring it back to its initial equilibrium position, meaning that the restoring force is in the opposite direction of the displacement. So it looks like um, a concave up parabola. That's what the potential energy graph looks like. Um, and on the flip side, a unstable equilibrium would be a potential energy max where the force after a small displacement is in the direction of the displacement so it's moving away from the equilibrium position that's something that you should definitely know since they love to ask multiple choice type questions on that okay example nine why explain why an object in uniform circular motion has no work done on it so if we just draw a circle in uniform circular motion, we know that Fc, or the net force, points inwards toward the circle. And the tangential velocity is obviously tangent to the circle. So dr is proportional to the tangential velocity because v is equal to dr dt. So dt is just a scalar, so it doesn't change the direction at all. So dr is in the same direction as a tangential velocity. So the work we know is equal to the integral of f dot dr, which we can then write as f d cosine theta. But as we can see in this diagram, theta would be equal to 90 degrees here. So the cosine of 90 degrees is zero. So this would be the integral of zero, which is zero. So no work is done. Okay. That's something really important. An ideal spring with constant k is cut in half. So this is a springs question, which is very important. Um, so normally when they are when you're having questions on springs, they're gonna ask about springs in series rather than parallel, because in parallel you just add them together. It's very simple. Um, so with springs in series, the formula is 1 over k equivalent is equal to 1 over k1 plus 1 over k2, right? So if both of the springs are cut in, if it's cut in half, both of these springs are going to have the same spring constant. So one, I'll just call it k prime, and k equivalent will let that be equal to the spring constant of the original larger spring. So 1 over k equivalent is equal to 2 over k prime. So basically that means that k prime is equal to 2 k equivalent. So that means that the spring constant of each of the smaller springs after you cut them in half would be equal to 2 times the original spring constant of the larger spring. So that would just be choice E. So that's pretty much everything for this video. So for work energy and power, it's mainly just important to look at how the energy is changing and what is causing the energy to change. And if you're able to look at it from that lens, you'll be able to solve a lot of problems. Um, it can even make dynamics questions and things like that a lot faster because you can kind of employ shortcuts. For example, when we were looking at projectiles and stuff like that, for example, finding the velocity of the projectile as it hits the ground or something, it's a lot easier now because you can just use conservation of energy. So our next video will be coming out very, very soon for your finals review, and it'll be on momentum and conservation of momentum and also center of mass. Um, which is the next topic, and that also deals a lot with energy when we're talking about collisions and different things like that. So that's something definitely to keep in mind when reviewing this chapter, because work and energy is definitely something that comes up forever. It's pretty much like forces. Um, it's something that you really need to master. So thank you so much for watching this.